Hello, greetings, what's happening? Today, we are here with my Seiko TE6B sewing machine. The B signifies that it has reverse. I do not need the reverse function, however. At the time of ordering, this was the only Seiko TE6 in the country, and I did not want to wait three months for a special order one. It was a little more expensive, but that is the price you pay for convenience. Let's get into it. The Seiko TE6 is a pretty simple machine. It's been around for a very long time. The TE series, that is. TE1. TE2 was actually a walking foot machine. TE3, 4, 5, 6. As far as I know, they're all exactly the same. And I don't know why they changed the numbering system. Maybe to just keep it fresh, like the iPhones. Anyway. This is a bit of a unique machine, uh, as most people in America have triple feed walking foot sewing machines. A triple feed walking foot machine basically means that... This is difficult to explain without a diagram. Here we go. There's two feet that alternate up and down. That's the first thing you need to know. On the bottom, there's a feed dog. The center foot and the needle go forward with the feed dog, grab the material, pull it back. As the needle raises, the center foot raises as well, and the outer foot steps down to hold the material while the middle foot, needle, and feed dog advance to grab the material again. Whew. I think I think that may be uh, Maybe clear to some of y'all out there. Anyway, this machine is unique because it just has a feed dog that moves the material. The needle just goes up and down, and the presser foot, alternately, you could use a presser wheel, is just riding on a spring and moves up and down as the material thickness changes. So, when looking down at the machine and, you know, while it's in use, it's much easier to see where your needle is actually going and, you know, hitting your transitions and marks and all that stuff. That's why I really like this machine, basically because it has an uncluttered field of view. Although, just having one method of feeding the material makes things a little more difficult if you care about how whatever you're sewing looks on the bottom. Stock, these machines come with a very, very aggressive toothy feed dog, and that makes sense. Because you're just relying on one thing to move the material, it really needs to stick in there, grab it, and pull it back. But if you're trying to sew fine leather goods like I am, it's kind of a nightmare. So, first thing one would think of is maybe I'll smooth it out. When you smooth it out, you have very little to no friction grabbing the material and it slips and doesn't feed reliably, which, I mean, isn't necessarily a bad thing if you mark out all your stitches like I do, but it's very time consuming. If you'd like to have the best of both worlds, you can do what I did, and a lot of people seem to do in Japan, is put rubber on the feed dog. In order to bond rubber to this feed dog, you have to fill in the teeth, which can either be done by brazing, welding, or using JB Weld putty, which I really like to use as it's very easy, not messy at all, and you can easily sand it back down flat. In addition to that, it has still a bit of a little toothiness that I think really helps when bonding rubber to it. So, get yourself some JB Weld putty. What else do I have to say about this? As far as bonding rubber to the feed dog goes, I've tried just about every glue under the sun, and sure enough, super glue works the best. Naturally, it's the glue that I had sitting on my desk the entire time I was experimenting with all these fancy different glues. It really seems to chemically bond the rubber to whatever you're gluing it to as it melts it, and yeah, it just basically makes it all one piece. Pretty, pretty surprising, and I use the Loctite version. It claims to be less brittle. Uh, I don't know if that's actually true, because most super glues are pretty brittle and sh not very shock resistant, so it wouldn't necessarily be a good idea one wouldn't think it would be necessarily a good idea to use on a feed dog, but it works perfectly well. So please, please try it. This is actually my second 
TE6 or TE series machine. I had a TE5, I believe, that I got off Yahoo Auctions when I first started out in this whole sewing machine game. And uh, it sewed beautifully, but the problem was in shipping, this flywheel broke off. I thought it was a flywheel problem, so I replaced the flywheel, which, I mean, that was a problem. But an underlying issue that occurred, and I didn't realize it till later, was that this shaft running down here, I don't know what the technical term of it, but it's like basically a camshaft, it was slightly bent as a result of that. And throughout the rotation of the flywheel and the shaft, it would hang up and then it would jump forward once the, the friction decreased, once it got past the, the bend. And it just made it a huge pain in the ass to sew because it would, it would, like, it would be loping, you know? So it just infuriated me. So I ended up taking it apart, trying to straighten out the camshaft, that didn't work. I couldn't find a new camshaft for it. So I uh, thought it was basically useless. And I threw it in the dumpster, which I'm ashamed of, but I was, I was fed up at the time. So, I mean, it was my dumpster. I didn't throw it in somebody else's dumpster. It could be worse. Anyway, so I ordered a new machine and I thought that would solve all my problems. Lo and behold, it did not. New machines rarely solve any problems. In fact, they present a lot of problems. So the first thing I noticed was my tension was whacked. No matter what I said, I, you know, had the bobbin all set nicely, you know, like gently pulled. No matter what I did, you know, change the needle size, all that stuff, the loop was still hanging up on the bottom of the material. And I mean, I'm pretty well versed in sewing machines. I have a bunch of sewing machines around here. I've bought a bunch of broken ones, fixed them, gotten them, you know, all running and all that stuff. Just, uh, I kind of know what I'm doing. And it was just infuriating me. So finally, I did actually save the throat plate and a couple feet and some other stuff from that past TE sewing machine. And uh, I noticed that the hole in the throat plate was enlarged. Something to consider when, you know, buying any sewing machine is like, what diameter of thread is it capable of sewing out of the box? And what I came to realize was, as I like to sew with larger threads because I, you know, make leather goods, that the thread, when it was folded over, coming up from the, you know, the bottom of the bobbin, it was just too large of a diameter wad, and it was hitting the perimeter of the hole in the throat plate. And it was immediately apparent when I looked at my old throat plate and the hole was about 40% larger. So what I did was just put that throat plate on and that solved all of my tension problems. The next problem I ran into was the machine was marking the bottom of the leather. And when I say marking the bottom of the leather, I don't mean that the feed dog was grabbing it with its teeth and marking it because I had addressed that already. So now I'll take a moment to sew a sample piece to show you these marks that I was referencing. And I'll give you a better idea of what I'm trying to combat here with this whole process. Go back stitch. All right, this is the marking I was talking about. You can see that parallel line in relation to the stitch about seven millimeters away. That is my nemesis. May not seem like a lot, but keep in mind, this is a flat piece of material. If I was sewing something like the perimeter of a bifold wallet and had the extra bulk in the center of those card slots, the tapering of the leather would really engage with that and make it very, very ugly. That is what I'm trying to avoid. I'll zoom in here to show you exactly what's going to be happening, but basically we're going to be minimizing this peak of that plate and rounding it off as much as possible. In short, a lot of grinding has to be done. Okay, we got the culprit right here. This is the plate I was talking about. This is the ridge I was talking about. This ridge is a little proud of this whole assembly right here with the throat plate and everything. So I'm gonna take about half a millimeter to a millimeter off the ultimate height of it. Now, I don't need to take an entire millimeter off this, you know, circumference, just this part right here with the feed dog and foot. And then I'll taper it off here, taper it off there. 
Once I take the height off, I'll round it off and polish it up nicely. So when it does touch, inevitably, it won't mark or it will mark as little as possible. And I know this is possible to get it to make no marks because my previous machine made literally zero marks on the bottom. It was amazing. In order to be as precise as possible, I'm going to use some die cam. And despite its name and appearance, this is not makeup for lesbian smurfs. In fact, this is a tool for machinists. Alrighty, I'm gonna let this dry and then I'm gonna scribe a line with some dividers about 0.75 millimeters. That will give me a target to grind to so I won't grind too much, too little, or not at the correct radius. Alrighty, I'm at home now in a back shed. This is where all the dirty shit happens. Got my two by 72 inch belt grinder behind me. Things, I think, uh, I think it's one and a half horsepower or maybe it's one horsepower. Either way, it's a bit of a beast, and this little flange will be no problemo. Let's get to it. So I'm getting pretty close to my marks that I made, and it's time to start radiusing it. The way I like to radius stuff is to put a little slack in this belt. I'm going to change to a finer grit. This is a 120. This is far too coarse to be radiusing. Probably switch to a 400 so I can go really slow, make it nice and smooth. Put some slack in here, and then you force it down, and the belt actually contours and makes a very, very nice radius. Let's do it. Got my 400 on here. This is actually a J-weight belt. That means that it's very flexible. The other belts, you know, 60, 120, those orange blaze belts are very, very, have a very, very stiff backing. These J weights are very, very soft and great to contour and just smooth things out. This is looking very nice. Okay, now I've gotten to a radius that I'm pretty happy with. I'm going to switch to a cork belt, which is kind of cool because it is uh, somewhat soft and contours even further to the shape that you're trying to round off. And what I do is I put a ton of stropping compound on it so it polishes and shapes and smooths and it's just kind of a one and done deal. I probably will buff it afterwards just to like give it that extra pop and shininess, but uh, let's go to the cork. Finish up with a little hand sanding and then uh, time to hit the buffer. Here we go, the moment of truth. Let's get a back stitch in. From this angle, you should be able to see the difference. This is before. You can see that rut running down along the stitch. This is after. No rut or markings whatsoever. Pretty happy with it.